My name is Justin, and this is my other life. All of this started as just a side project, but sometimes the side project is the true project. If you want to learn more about my research, writings, or videos, or if you want to find more conversations like this one, check out theotherlifenow.com. And by the way, all of my work is supported by my audience, so huge thanks to all my patrons and to everyone who throws me some support every now and then. But hey, if you get what I'm doing and you're into it, even just a random email would be nice. It's good to hear from people. Or you could certainly leave a review on iTunes. That's really useful because it helps other people find the show. Uncle, I was just watching what you were saying about uh, esports. Uh, near where I live is a city called Katowice, and they have some kind of gaming convention. And I was talking to a bit, some people a bit younger than me, and they were going, oh, yeah, we're going to meet so many gamers. <laughs> and I was thinking of all the kind of people you want to meet in the world, celebrity gamers. <laughs> but I'm, I'm an old man. How old are you, if you don't mind? Uh, 27. Oh, okay, you're younger than me. <laughs> Um, so do you, were you listening to what I was saying? Do you want to just start by respond? Do you want to jump right in by responding to anything I was saying? Or, um, actually maybe better would be, uh, you could just tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, my name's Ben. Uh, I'm, was born in England, but I live in Poland. Uh, I've written for various publications, some of them associated with a movement that might have the initials IDW. Okay including Quillette, Aereo, uh, the Catholic Herald, the American Conservative, uh, Arc Digital, and some other smaller ones. Brad, and what brought you to Poland? I'm just curious. I was just offered a job. It was just chance, but I loved it so much that I stayed. Oh, really? You liked it there. That's cool. So um, do you mind if I ask what you do for a living? Uh, I work in teaching. Okay, cool. So do you teach English or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Awesome. So how long have you been in Poland? Uh, coming up on five years. Wow. So you must really like it. Are you, are you like considering staying there forever? Oh, I am. Yeah. Especially with Brexit looming and I don't know. Uh, I don't have any enthusiasm to go back to the, uh, the, the, the sinking ship. Yeah. Uh, I hear you, man. Not- I mean, I'm, I'm like a U.S. citizen and I've been living here for five years and, uh, yeah, it does feel a bit like a sinking ship, doesn't it? I'm, I'm a little like, I'm kind of like looking, looking outward. <laughs> it is, it is looking at Twitter gives you a blinkered image because whenever I go back to England, it seems so normal. When I look at Twitter, it feels like it's just an apocalyptic wasteland with occasional parties for football. Yeah. So you do come back often or no? Uh, a couple of times a year to see the family in. Right. Uh, right. So, so, okay, cool. So now people know a little bit about who you are and, uh, thanks for joining me. I should say, by the way, I appreciate it. No worries. So it always helps to have like some other human energy with me. I mean, I can rant for like two hours by myself easy, but I don't know if people like that. And it, it's, you do start to run out of steam. So it's much better to have someone to dialogue with. Did you mm-hmm. happen to hear what I was saying about, uh, the, the group that shall not be named? And did you have any comments on what I was saying or, we could just take yeah, it. yeah, I, I, I did listen to that, and I think you're right. I think of it more, uh, more as a kind of loose network of social clubs that happen to discuss ideas than any kind of coherent intellectual movement. And th- there is value in that. Like I'm, uh, I really like Quillette. I, re- I quite like Jordan Peterson. Uh, I think we've all got a thousand opinions on him now, but most of mine. A positive, uh, but there's also drawbacks to that. Uh, one of them is a kind of pretentiousness. Uh, definitely, when I listen to some of the more blatant self-promoters uh, in the movement, like a man with the initials DR, uh, it feels as if they're uh, kind of as if they contain all dissident thought within right. themselves, which is right. very much untrue. Yeah, for sure. For sure. That's, I think I was kind of alluding to that also. Um, you know, the way I see it is like, also someone asked me earlier today in, in one of my channels, someone asked me like, why 
what is this idea of the cathedral? Like, why do people use this word cathedral? Um, and it occurs to me right now that it's a, this is a really good moment to actually answer that question because it connects to what we're talking about. Like, in my mm -hmm. view, there has been a long term artificial suppression of, of thought and speech, like for quite a while. Um, yeah. And one word for that is, you know, if you ask, like, who's doing that or what's doing that, it's a very simplified, uh, very, very simplified shorthand, but it's it's not too simplified. And it's quite useful to say um, it's something like a cathedral, uh, which is, of course, Moldbug's word for basically like journalists and the media, higher education and like nonprofit organizations mm. basically as i understand it uh like the these three sectors if you will for for several decades now have have kind of slowly and increasingly kind of uh clamped down on what anyone is really like permitted to to think or say in public and still get like cultural accolades um and by the way, I think some of that is sorry, craziness on the street. Some of that is good. Like some of that, right, is associated with like a genuine long term decline in things like racism, which is mm -hmm. which is a salutary implication. It's positive effect of this kind of trend. Um, but also just like a lot of uh, perfectly decent, normal, good people have had to kind of uh, not necessarily even silence themselves but they kind of fall away from these institutional organs of like what gets promoted as like good ways to think and influential prestigious ways to think. Right. So basically all I'm going, where I'm going with this is just to say that um, there have been, there has been this kind of long-term artificial suppression and, you know, you can only suppress large numbers of human beings for so long until like things snap, you know, like mm. I think Henry Miller said, like anything held together by force is doomed. Like in the end, things tend to, you know, reequilibrate pressure, pressure cookers tend to, you know, you know, they explode if you if you like try to suppress too much energy yeah. for too long. So all that's happening right now that, you know, I think is the true like phenomenon behind what people are calling the IDW or whatever. There's a very real phenomenon, and that's basically just the escape of all of this like suppressed intellectual energy. And that's a mass phenomenon. Like that has nothing to do with any particular individuals. That's like uh, thousands and thousands of people. Uh, and it, yeah, so that's what I think. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. And also, uh, this definitely isn't the fault of everyone in the movement, for want of a better word. Uh, but some of them really play up the idea of themselves as dissidents and dark. And uh, Barry Weiss's, or Weiss's, I don't know, profile in the New York Times with Sam Harris standing in a field. Yeah. Uh, looking moody. Yeah. And they're really, most of them really aren't that controversial. Uh, and if they were that controversial, they wouldn't be getting sympathetic profiles in the New York Times. Like, yeah, Moldbug, for example, wasn't the edgiest person in the world, but there's no way they'd do a long profile with pictures of him standing in a field. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, again, like my my background and like long experience in, in like social movements, it basically has has inoculated me against all of this stuff, because we, what you see time and time again in the history of social movements, it's like as soon as anyone starts getting cozy with like mainstream journalists it's over like mm -hmm. it's all over um in terms in terms of like significant dynamic dangerous cultural and social changes uh or threat or threats to power you know so it's like i think that's yeah so i mean that's 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 why i'm kind of like i have no interest in it like positively or negatively really like it's a like this sort of branding this does this sort of branding type of project or movement it's it's the exact opposite of where, like, if you're really interested in kind of like liberating thought and liberating speech and overthrowing, you know, like uh, stupidly repressive institutions and unleashing intelligence and, and things like that, like if that's what you're all about, you'll run as far and fast as you can away from any type of like cool, you know, sexy, like journalistic uh, marketing uh, package, uh, I, I think. Yeah, I, I think the best way of looking at it in a healthy way is that it's the friends we made along the way, or whatever the phrase is. Uh, and we have our different avenues of intellectual inquiry, and we can support each other as we go down them. But it's not some kind of um, coherent body of intellectual or political activism, because I think people are so different that whenever 
I mean, like Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris, for example, mm. clearly incredibly different thinkers. So whenever they try and find common ground, it just ends up with uh, an hour of backslapping about how open to free speech they are. Uh, yeah. Which doesn't sure. really achieve anything. I mean, you know what else I th- I also tend to think like, and I, as I said, I follow, I've followed all of this stuff like for the past year, very, very closely. You know, I'm like an extremely online person, as they say, extremely online. I don't really like hang out with people very much at all, uh, but I, but I, you know, read and watch things like a lot. Um, so I've, I've like listened to probably an embarrassing uh, majority of the uh, content that people like, you know, whatever Dave Rubin and Joe Rogan and these people have put out over the past like year or whatever. I have been following it quite closely. And one of the things I've, I've really been thinking is that one of the reasons why this kind of like centralized kind of like high, high prestige or high kind of like high profile, high visibility kind of like uh, packaging or marketing that's, that's going on with this sort of phenomenon is so doomed is because all of these people, one thing that they all have in common is that I think they're all genuinely, uh, they care a lot about, how should I put this? Like respectability, you know, mm-hmm. they, they really do care. They, they still have a mental model in which there is like a, uh, there's like a, a mainstream elite kind of like gatekeeping world. And the goal is to kind of like penetrate that, you know? Obviously, yeah. like some, you know, like someone like Joe Rogan or whatever, like podcasting and YouTube is like a DIY affair for the most part. But the way that they talk and the way that they debate, you can tell that they're always kind of like they're thinking about, like, how can we get these ideas into the minds of like all the New York Times journalists? Like they mm. think that's where the center of pa- they still think that's where the center of power is. Like they're still kind of referring back to, I think, an institutionalized distribution of power that actually in my reading and my model of the world, it, it just no longer even holds. Like if I were them, like if I was fucking Eric Weinstein, I would just be on YouTube every day using my fucking genius like galaxy brain to actually like make new theories and promote like new ways of, of doing a million different things like on an everyday basis. But there's a reason why they're not really doing that stuff. Like there's a reason why they're not really seriously like generating new models and new ideas and new projects like with people in dynamic growing spontaneously uh, emerging cultures. Like they're not doing that type of thing. And that's because their eyes are still on the, Mm -hmm. you know, on, on the center, their eyes are still on this like imaginary center of power that they still kind of hold themselves uh, hostage to. And to me, like the real exciting thing right now is like people just deciding to fucking break from that altogether and just go totally rogue. That's my yeah, there's, there's a lot to be said for that. I mean, if you if you want to have influence, you've got to build institutions because uh, otherwise everything is atomized. I mean, I, I guess if if your sole interest is intellectual curiosity, then it doesn't really matter to you how influential you are because you, you know if you discover a truth. To some extent, it doesn't matter whether you're the only person in the world who knows it because it's yours. Uh, but if you want to influence society, you do need to build institutions. But I mean, clearly, they've shown that that can be done independently. Like, I think there are probably right. vastly richer publications than Quillette, which have smaller readerships or uh, someone like Dave Rubin or Joe Rogan. Uh, they have higher viewerships and much more respectable people. So they don't need that kind of uh, status. Uh, I think I think when they did that profile in the New York Times, Alice Strager, who I don't know much about, to be fair, but she did put out a post saying, why do I need... I think it basically said, why do I need the New York Times to come and talk to me about uh, what I'm doing and try to club me in with these other people who don't have a lot to do with what I'm doing. Uh, right. Oh, so was she was she approached to be in that article? Yeah, yeah. I think I think she said they even sent a photographer to her, and oh, she wow. was just standing around thinking about how ridiculous it was. And I oh, think wow. she asked to be that's fascinating. Not to be included. I read her book. Uh, it's really good. She's she's really cool. It seems from what I know from her book. Um, so mm. and that that makes me even more interested in her uh, her. I guess ideas and, and stance and perspective. So that's interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so anyway, 
maybe uh, maybe we're being a little too gossipy. Although <laughs> we talked about another piece of gossip we're going to get to, which I think I'm quite interested in that piece of gossip. But maybe we should uh, wait on that and mm -hmm. take a break. Take a break. Take a break from the. Uh, the Twitter gossip and uh, internet gossip, and maybe for a little bit talk about maybe some bigger, bigger thoughts or bigger ideas. Um, like for instance, religion, you've written a lot about religion, but as I kind of said in the, in the tweet for this, like you're kind of interesting because for someone who doesn't believe in God or is agnostic with respect to that question, you sure write a lot about religion and you seem to, you know, really, really care about it. Like, it seems like you're really, you're really deeply wrestling with it, even though you don't count yourself a believer, if I understand correctly. Could you maybe just um, start by maybe uh, telling our listeners like what about what, you know, just give us a kind of elevator, elevator pitch about your, your interest in religion. Like why, why do you write so much about religion? Uh, so there are, there are different uh, levels to it. One is just personal background. I mean, I don't want to, go on a tedious biography that will only be interested, interesting to me. But I was raised religious, so I mean, I'm sure that affected my psyche. Then I became a Christopher Hitchens-esque, obnoxious anti-theist. Uh, but I'm sure it stuck with me in some way. Uh, on one level, I just find the question of uh, God's existence fascinating and uh, re relevant, even if the affirmative answer is implausible. If there's a very low probability that it's true, it's still uh, a very relevant question. And generally, when I read people writing about religion now, even in a sympathetic way, it's in a kind of Petersonian way where the allegorical truth of religion is what matters. And the actual question of God's existence isn't very important. Uh, it's just about the function of religion. Uh, and that's all that matters. But uh, to me, you know, if there's even a very small chance that there's uh, an immense supernatural intelligence who may or may not expect certain things from our behavior and may or may not uh, have some kind of surprise planned for us after death, uh, that question is just fantastically important. And I'm definitely no expert on uh, the philosophical debates behind it, but I see enough ignorance uh, on the atheistic side that I'm not convinced there isn't merit to the question. Okay. Yeah, that's and what... Then, oh, sorry, go on. You're breaking up a little bit. On the other level, I think that if you are going to say that religion has uh, functional value... Uh, but then you're going to say that the belief isn't important. I think uh, it's going to be very difficult to maintain the same kind of values and the same kind of rituals without that belief binding it together. Right, right. So wh where have you come down on this question? Like, wh what is your view on, like, what, what in your view is the accurate uh, judgment on questions of faith and God? Uh, I wouldn't even want to put that most tentative conclusion. Okay. Um, I'm very interested in uh, kind of Thomist metaphysics. Uh, there are different philosophers I respect a lot, like uh, Edward Fazer uh, from America. Uh, there's another philosopher I find very interesting called Alexander Proust. I think his name is, though I'm still so ignorant, I can't really understand his arguments, but they're clearly, there's, there's such a level of sophistication behind them, which granted could be plain obscurantism because sophistication uh, isn't valuable in itself. But like I say, I still see so many uh, just blatant fallacies from people on the atheistic side, the kind of what caused God uh, level of argumentation that I'm still very interested in learning more and keeping these debates alive because I think I just written a piece with my friend Paul Bryan for uh, Public Discourse magazine which is about how apathyism is more dangerous to religion than atheism because hmm. now new atheism is a bit passe and whenever anyone says something too Dawkins-esque we'll post our Shrek fedora memes at them if you've seen them 
Yeah. Uh, but the danger of apathyism, where the question of God's existence is kind of taken off the table, is it's better to be having the argument than not having the argument, because um, you might not lose so many people so quickly, but it's a slow, inevitable decline if nobody's talking about it. So I want to reinvigorate those conversations. That's really interesting. And I, I have a lot of respect for that and a lot of personal kind of interest in, in your angle on that, because I'm kind of slow. I, I won't go into my own story too much either, but like I'm kind of currently, I guess I could say I'm, I'm, I'm slowly kind of moving back towards religion after like being, you know, completely fallen from it for, you know, a long time. And um, like, for instance, like I went to confession last week, I, I was raised Catholic and, you know, it was like confirmed and everything um, when I was like 14. So I'm like, you know, a member of the Catholic church in some sense, but I gave that up when I, you know, right when I was done with my confirmation, when I was like 14, that was like the last time I went to church. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had, you know, I, over the past couple of years, I've kind of gone a few times. Cause I have, as I said, I've been kind of moving back towards yeah, just thinking a lot about it and kind of grappling with it. Um, and I decided to, to continue like grappling with it more and more. And, and I decided like, I would just go to confession because why not? Like, I'll, I'll just, I don't want to sound glib, but that sounds glib. Like, and I don't want to mean, I don't want to be glib. Like I, I went, I was like, I'm leaning towards it. I'm, I, I'm kind of, I'm curious and I want to kind of, it's hard to describe, but I guess like, I guess I do believe in God in some sense, but I don't know what sense yet, you know, and this is where like Jordan Peterson, I think is so good on this point, like, because it's, it's something that you wrestle with. Like it doesn't make a lot of sense, you know? And it's like, it's mysterious. Like there are mysteries, like there are mysteries. Our existence is mysterious. There are unanswered questions. And I, I don't know, but it's like you're saying, uh, Ben, like the stakes are high. Like it, the stakes are high. It really, really matters if you get it right or wrong. And, mm. and, and we don't really know, but it's so confusing and it's so mysterious. So it's like, I take that seriously as all. And as I take it seriously, more and more kind of data in my phenomenology, I guess you could say, points in, in support of, of, of a religious commitment. Um, mm -hmm. And that's kind of where I'm at. So I'm like, okay, let's, well, let's just keep moving forward with it uh, and see what happens, like with an open mind, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So I was like, I'll go to confession. Uh, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm a, I'm technically a member of the church. Like I'll just go and I'll, I'll talk to the priest about everything I've done bad <laughs> and what could go wrong. Like what's bad about that? That sounds like a good idea to do anyway. I'm, I'm ranting now about my own personal life, but that's, that's like strong context for like where I'm, where I'm at with thinking about these things. Um, and I guess my punchline is just to say that, um, whether you're agnostic or like a devout religious person or whatever, like, and I guess this is something that you and I will agree on. Like, all you can really do is your absolute best to to like to to penetrate like the truth of of the mysteries that we are confronted with and maybe because they're mysteries there's going to be a lot of like undecidability and a lot of like underdetermination of where people land but all you can do is like what what seems best to you given all of your data um and like, I think if you're, I think basically, I think what I would like to kind of flesh out a little bit more by writing, I, this is something I want to write about in the, in the coming months or years is like how you can be religious and a good, even a good religious, you know, uh, devout, or you can have a devout religious commitment and also be like very honest about your uncertainties and your incomprehensions and, and your kind of extra rational mm -hmm. decisions that go into it. You know, like that's what I'm trying to do. It's like, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to do that. Yeah. Because so, to some extent, our beliefs must be extra rational. Like I, I believe in objective truth and the means uh, we have to pursue those objective truths. And one thing I do believe is I think there are, almost certainly objective ways of determining whether there is a God or not, uh, philosophical ways, but there might not be in, uh, to some extent the, the intellectual tools we have in some cases, they might not be advanced enough that we can know what the truth is. Hmm. 
And it's a bit like if you're standing on a hill and you're looking through the mist and you see things in the distance and you can't conclusively say what they are. And you'd be lying if you claimed that you could conclusively say what they are. But you know there are things and you can see, even if you can't see them properly, so even if you can't analyze things in a wholly rational way, you can still make some kind of, uh, some kind of, uh, you can still maybe even have some kind of a prejudice, some kind of a guess, some kind of a prediction as to what they are without claiming uh, that you can objectively prove it. Right. I like that. I like that image a lot. Yeah. Um, we have a question from the audience that I think is very urgent for you to answer, Ben. Um, Alex P Patterson wants to know, he wants me to hold you accountable for your problematic opinion that the album Home Like No Place There Is by The Hotelier is the best emo revival album. Can you please account for that? I don't even know who I'm, that is or what that is. I'm sorry, it's just true. It's it's one of the greatest albums ever, in my opinion. Are you Although a that's a very niche opinion. I wouldn't claim that that's objectively true. Are uh, you a big fan of emo music? Uh, the kind of, not the kind of emo where people are painting their fingernails and <laughs> talking about their ex-girlfriends at excessive length. Okay. But, uh, yeah, I am. But you'll, you'll have to ask him what he thinks is the best. Cause... All right, Alex, you can put that in the comments. Um, I used to listen to a fair amount of emo music. Like when I was young, much younger, I used to listen to like, I used to be well into like Taking Back Sunday and uh, mm -hmm. like My Chemical Romance and uh, what else? I used to listen to like Death Cab for Cutie and what other emo? Um, like uh, like Bright Eyes. That's what oh, yeah. yeah right. um, my, I, I, I think I did listen to My Chemical Romance when I was a lot younger, but also my first like... Uh, my first appearance in any magazine was in the NME calling Gerard Way a dick. <laughs> years ago. I can't even really remember the context, but I wrote some kind of letter saying that he was obnoxious and was very proud to see nice. Ben Sixth. Nice. Someone also is asking, why did I stop listening to emo? Um, I don't know. <laughs> but, <You> grew up. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I'll get back into it now. Maybe, maybe like I will a spearhead the emo core wing of the intellectual dark web <laughs> i'll make i'll make like a big branded project around it um yeah maybe maybe that's like i think the, the most i used to have curious cat for my sins and yeah. the, the most difficult question i ever got is like you call yourself a conservative in something of a traditionalist how can you listen to emo <laughs> and i didn't have a good response i was just like oh, that was when you quit it. listening to emo <laughs> <laughs> that's funny <No. laughs> that's funny um so all right so what else i know we we, we kind of chatted about a bunch of possible topics um what are you working on at the moment that you're kind of like most interested in or what are you uh, thinking well, I, got this, I got this article uh coming out fairly soon uh, i'm working on a big article about Poland that I'm, I don't have a place, but I'm going to try and pitch it because it's the 100th anniversary of Polish independence this year. And uh, I think the reaction in the Western press is going to be very negative because rightly or wrongly, their political system is perceived very negatively. And I'm not going to comment on the political system because I'm a guest here. And uh, mm. I've been asked several times to write about their politics, but I think that would just be very rude. I compare it to uh, walking into someone's house and then advising them on their marriage. Uh, yeah. But it's about kind of Polish history and uh, offering some kind of hope, encouragement to the future. That's interesting. Um, I, that's very fascinating what you just said, because you know what, like even living in the UK, like I have felt that myself about like Brexit, for instance, like I don't even talk about it. I, w I won't even really talk about it at like dinner parties. Like I just don't really have an opinion. I don't really weigh in at all. Mm. And I haven't really thought about it that explicitly, but I think there's a major part of me that thinks about it in, in the way that you just described. Like it's really none of my business and, and it's almost inappropriate for me to, to comment on it. Actually, I mean, you, an interesting point you might find interesting is like as an academic, like most of my social groups are highly cosmopolitan. So, mm. you know, like the university I work at, it's like, half of the department is probably like 
uh, not from England. Half half might even be understating it. So like, you know, universities are these like very cosmopolitan international places and everyone, you know, for the most part, not everyone, but most people in my contacts in academia in the UK are generally anti-Brexit. And they're more than comfortable commenting on it at length, you know, Facebook posts and in the halls and, you know, like talking about how stupid Brexit is or how bad Brexit is. And, and, you know, part of me, I don't know if I've ever put this in, in words, but like, but I think about it now that we're talking about it, like there's something really pretty fucked up actually about like a foreigner working in the UK and making a good income at like, mm. you know, in like in pretty like competitive, hard to get jobs and, and having like a extended elaborate kind of like public uh, opposition to, to like the judgment of, of the referendum or to even have an opinion yeah. in it because like they're, they're interested parties. Like I'm an interested party. It's like, there's something fucked up about it. And, it, and, and interestingly enough, it kind of like feeds, it kind of makes me more sympathetic to Brexit because I'm kind of like, you know, these British people think that their country's being like overrun by foreigners. And actually in academia, there's a little bit of truth to that. Not like poor immigrants. I'm talking about like high education, high income foreigners who have like all the academic jobs here. Like, I think it's quite reasonable for British people to resent that. And it's certainly not my place to like tell them they're stupid for wanting to kick me out. Like I am taking their jobs, you know? (laughs) Well, I don't know if there'd be anyone suitable of taking your job, but uh, I mean, I I, I guess on there's some level on which I'm sympathetic when they complain about Brexit, if it threatens them, because I mean, potentially it'll threaten me, so. I can empathize with that. But definitely you need to, you need to have a level of respect when you're doing it because if you are living in another country then you you are a guest until you're a citizen. Uh, and I, I mean I'll 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 twist this by talking about English people abroad and it always annoys me when whenever I see some anglo pop up in the American press talking at length about what Americans should do from Hitchens to Milo to uh, Louise Mensch to Piers Morgan to John Oliver. I mean, I think Trump Trump should get on this Anglo invasion, uh, build a wall in the Atlantic, kick them out, because uh, I would be annoyed if I was American and I turned on my TV and I started listening to someone whose ancestors I'd violently broken away from <laughs> telling me what to do with my country. It's... it's it's pretty pretty outrageous. Right. Hey, I got to take a leak real quick. Um, could someone in the chat ask Ben a question that he can uh, dazzle you with giving an answer to while I run to the bathroom? Hey, whoever just said in the chat that they don't like Jews, none of that. I need to learn how to moderate these chats. I've never really put much time or energy into this, um, but I guess I'm going to have to figure out a way to not let people say fucked up shit in the chat. People, don't be racist. Don't say fucked up shit like that, please. Um, well, uh, I'm going to have to think about my policy on this. This is also sort of like off the cuff that I haven't really decided or given much thought to like what my free speech policy is in the chat. Uh, but I'll think about that. Um, someone ask Ben a question, please. So, I, so he can give you he can entertain you and uh, entertain himself while I go to the bathroom. Mm-hmm. We can wait. We can wait until then. Um, okay. So uh, I, I won't just I won't just leave you hanging, and I won't like put it on you to like come up with some song and dance. Um, the Triggerati asks you um, if you speak Polish yet. I don't speak Polish yet, and that is uh, a source of deep shame. To, I mean, I literally it's a source of uh, deep shame to me, and I've I've said it before, and I still haven't done enough uh, to change that because I can be very energetic about things and I can be very lazy about things. And for some reason, language learning is something I've been very lazy about. And as someone who wants to stay in Poland, that's definitely something I have to change because it's quite easy to live there and not learn Polish because I don't use it in my job. A lot of my friends I've met because they were quite excited to have the chance 
uh, to practice their English. And a lot of people I meet and just become acquaintances. They enjoy the novelty of it. And then I know enough Polish where it's not impractical if I'm doing my shopping or if someone wants directions. Uh, I'm not just blundering into the shop and pointing at food products and expecting them to hold my hand. So I don't think, or I hope it's not too inconvenient for the people I meet, but just uh, to avert future problems. And so I can be fully integrated into my community. Learning Polish is definitely uh, something I need to do with uh, the utmost energy. And I hope I've started doing that now with the aid of Duolingo and other clever apps. Dude, I really like your attitude, Ben. Like, I love your, like, self-punishing, super self-critical attitude. Like, how... I mean, that's why I'm attracted to Catholicism, of course. <laughs> I totally, yeah. No, I totally get it. I totally get that now. Um, and, I mean, this is why I like conservatives as people, like good conservatives, like smart conservatives like yourself. Because conservatives just, they care, like good ones, smart ones, like care. They just care a lot about, like being you know order and being good and doing the right thing and like they get angry at themselves and they get angry at others if they think that others aren't and or themselves are not doing the right thing and i like that i love that intensity i love that kind of like self-discipline i just i really appreciate that and like because i'm i'm kind of like temperamentally very much also like very lefty i mean i definitely have a kind of like you know ethical conscientious streak like which is one of the reasons why i'm also into catholicism um but temperamentally i'm also i have some like strong kind of like uh let's just say relaxed uh attitudes towards some things um so uh, and just because of my job and stuff like most of my milieu is is like temperamentally very relaxed let's say um so yeah that's why i like hanging out with and talking with conservatives as much as i can because i just love that kind of like ethical seriousness you know i mean one thank you very much first but one uh one risk to it is that you talk about how you've messed up and then you don't change it and then you go back to talking about how you've messed up so i've done this with I, i've often lamented uh or I've often criticized myself for not learning Polish and I slump back into laziness or uh -huh. just a million other habits and sins that I've felt really bad about and I've beaten myself up about it and I went right back to them. So saying it counts, but actually doing it and changing it is what's significant. Uh, sure. So, yeah, I have to be held accountable for this Polish thing. I should probably do some videos talking Polish and proving that I've, I've changed. Um, here's an interesting question from the chat. Uh, do you think sports-based tribalism is good, bad, or neutral? Uh, it's good until you start, like, beating the crap out of people in the street, mm. uh, which happens. Although even then, if people are beating the crap out of each other in a field, which I'm told sometimes happens in Poland, I guess if everyone's consented to it, it's not the worst thing in the world. Uh, wow. Potentially, it could become like a lazy outlet for social instincts. Um, but I think people who kind of mock sports ball are exaggerating the extent to which people are invested in sports. Uh, I don't think it's kind of replaced religion or nationalism or uh, other tribal values. It's just a small expression of them. Yeah, I think that's a fair way to put it. I mean, I guess one way to frame the question about whether it's good or bad is to ask, like, does it does it move people closer to, like, ethical cohesion or is it, yeah, kind of like more like a substitute? And I'm with you that it's definitely not, like, it's certainly not an actual substitute in anywhere near, near, near the proportions that, like, religion historically has been. Um, but I think there's a good case to be made that it is basically occupying the same kind of neural neural and social mm -hmm. circuits uh, just in a really like puny pathetic uh mm -hmm. short short term periodic way so in that sense like i i tend to th i guess i tend to fall on the more critical side of it like uh i mean i don't want to i don't I'm, I'm not like trying to take anyone's fun away from them i don't like this is not like one of my pressing like talking points uh but i do lean towards just to answer the question i do lean towards the view that sports tribalism 
is generally probably has a negative valence, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's, it could be like, uh, there's a term for this that I've forgotten, but uh, yeah, a replacement for instincts that could be funneled into a healthier direction. But I would be a very bad Englishman if I didn't say it's coming home. Right. Uh, um, football is coming home. Uh, I mean, I, ironically, I was supporting Poland and we went out in the first round. So I can't really celebrate if England win, but I still hope they do. That's funny. Um, we have one question here that is asking a very, very inappropriate, extremely rude question about the women in different countries, which I'm not going to ask here because I know that you would probably not like it. And I don't like it either. So sorry, we're skipping over that one. But here's a good one. Um, what is your opinion, Ben, on uh, anarchist primitivism? <laughs> Anarcho primitivism. Do you have an I, You don't have to have it, opinions. Well, it's general. I mean, it's generally low. Um, <laughs> but I have a fear that they're right. Really? Because okay. definitely there are technological trends which could go terribly wrong. Uh, someone made me laugh and internally cry the other day just by posting a tweet that said something like friendly reminder that every day there are thousands of nuclear warheads bristling in military bases that could wipe us all out in a moment. And I mean, there's that and there's the potential for uh, malignant super intelligences or there's the risk of pandemics and definitely uh, there's a very good book called the ingenuity gap by thomas homer dixon which came out in the 1990s which was about the, the potential risk that's building up within uh technological civilization and the potential that we won't have sufficient ingenuity to be able to um harness new powers for good or to defuse ticking time bombs and uh, to that extent the anarcho-primitivists had a point because if we were without this technology we wouldn't have that level of existential risk on the other hand going from what we have now to anarcho-primitivism uh, would be such an intensely bloody process that it would make I don't know it would make Ted Kaczynski look like the friend the old grandfather that some of these anarcho-primitivists think he is. Mm. So I, I, I really see the attraction. Right. Uh, but I don't know, maybe maybe I'm just too much of a technological cuck or whatever. But. <laughs> um, yeah, my, I don't, I could probably expound on like deeper stuff, but my, my immediate kind of instinct about it is I like the part of it that basically suggests I should not be working so much on like bullshit, <laughs> like bullshit institutionalized, like mediated, alienated labor. Um, yeah, I'm highly sympathetic to that idea. But so as, as a justification or an ideology for me to like quit my job and like go buy a cabin in the woods, I like it. I think we, I, we, we also, I mean, as much as what I've said about risk is true. Uh, it would be dumb to romanticize how life was before uh, the Industrial Revolution and the technological revolutions uh, and reaching any kind of peaceable and uh, any kind of peaceful state where all the needs of whoever's left alive are met uh, would be incredibly difficult anyway. So I see the appeal, but it's much easier to tweet about than to go and live it. Right. I think I'm kind of I kind of agree with something you said before in that I think the anarchist primitivist like critique is probably right in the sense that like, yeah, this whole like technological industrial society thing was probably like a bad idea <laughs> uh, in the long run. It's probably it's probably a bad idea. Um, like I see this through like the Faust myth, you know, like I think it's a Faustian it's a Faustian bargain. Like I think technology is a Faustian bargain. I mean, it gets you really good, attractive things in the short run that no one can deny. You know, it's 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 a it's a it's a deal with the devil that you can't you can't deny. It's it's too good to say no to. Like that's what intelligence is. Like intelligence itself, I actually think has that kind of structure. Like the intelligent exploitation of the environment to achieve something that you desire like to promote your survival or whatever 
um, using technology to like make food more plentiful and make society more stable and create better houses and promote all of these things that are undeniably desirable to human beings. Technology lets you do that. Intelligence exploitation lets you do that. And it also fucks you in the long run. Okay. So you end up making like structures that are that, that have a plan of their own uh, mm. that's quite above you and quite outside of your control. To me, that's like the whole, that's the whole meaning of like the, you know, the, uh, in some sense, this is one of the whole meanings of religion to me. Like I see all of the world religions as kind of encoded systems trying to prevent precisely this catastrophe. Um, mm. Like it's all there. I mean, it's it's all there. Um, I, I, I think I like the Faustian myth as like a especially kind of effective mm. and colorful one. Like I think Goethe really understood that, you know, like modern intellectuals are really the the representatives of, of this, um, of this Faustian bargain. But um, yeah, so I'm very sympathetic to that. But now that it's like 2018 and I was born into this like technological industrial society, like I'm not going to go live in the woods and like shit in like a composter or something like that. I'm going to ride. A, this- it, it's a bit like walking up a mountain and getting into trouble and then someone saying, wouldn't it be better if we hadn't climbed this mountain? Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. But we're on this mountain. Uh, right. There's not right. much we can do about it. Yeah, and also it's like, yeah, exactly. Another another metaphor here that I like is like the genie's out of the bottle, you know, yeah, yeah. You know like putting it back in. Um, so, yeah, but I don't know. I, I am, I am kind of interested in and open to some of the more interesting and intelligent, like, kind of back to the land projects, but with like technological mm. bents, you know, like people who are experimenting with ways to live off the grid that are it's not just like hippie bullshit but it's like technologically sophisticated like i don't know if you've ever heard of like the decelerationism kind of like movement or whatever Dec- no i've heard of decelerationism but not there on twitter it's called like deck dec so like um, accelerationism is usually marked acc and mm. there are some people now that like talk and write with this like slogan of like dec um mm. which is short for deceleration and i i actually i'm trying to talk with some of them i, I need to email some of them because i really want to hear what they're doing and what they think but it's basically anarcho primitivist types of people but um i don't know some of them seem like kind of interesting and kind of um kind of like promising like my my wager or feeling or just my intuition is that um like maybe maybe and this is just an open empirical question but maybe like the technological gains that we've uh been blessed to have can be perhaps if you're really creative and courageous and willing to like buck the trend of of modern society as a whole can be repurposed for like Mm. sustain for sustaining like much better healthier human communities Mm. if you but you but you'd have to be willing to basically like totally re-engineer things in a in a like really creative way i'm open to that i definitely my my priors want to to believe in that i I would love to hear that Um, i definitely think it will come to that or something catastrophic like i want to believe that we can control the future of technology i'm not convinced that we can uh but if we can then we should try at least and unless you're a pure uh cold-blooded accelerationist uh and you just want to see the world zap into a puff of software or whatever i don't know so something really funny just happened in the chat which i need to tell people about basically someone asked us uh to talk about whether women are hotter in poland or hungary and that was what I said before that I said, I'm not going to ask this because Ben is a conservative and I, I can tell from his temperament, he would not appreciate this somewhat arguably rude question. Um, so that was what I was referring to before when I said, I'm not going to ask it. And then uh, guess what? My mother-in-law <laughs> appeared in the chat, <laughs> my, my mother-in-law, her name's Sharon. Uh, bless her. She's very sweet. Very cool. If she's still listening to this, hi mom. Um, but you know, you don't expect your mother-in-law to appear in like your YouTube streaming chat when you're talking yeah. about like accelerationism. <laughs> I, I will tell one funny story related to that question, which is a few years ago on Eurovision, the Polish entry was uh, a very weird song about Slavic women. 
Uh, and when they were performing this song, it was all of these uh, young ladies coming out dressed in kind of revealing takes on traditional clothes and all churning butter for some reason. And the next day I woke up and I think like two or three of my friends had sent me messages saying, oh, Ben, Poland, huh? Been thinking about coming over. And I had to message back and say, you know, they don't actually dress like that and just stand in the street churning butter. <laughs> well, but is it is it like palpably uh, and significantly like a much more traditionalist society? Like, is that one of the things that you like about it? Uh, I think in the cities it's more traditional, but uh, you could often forget it if you're going to a bar, if you're going to a club. Uh, you could you could you could quite easily forget that you were living in a Catholic country. On the other hand, if you walk past a church on a Sunday morning, it's always so full that people are spilling out of the doors. Whereas, if you walk past a church in England on a Sunday morning, you can probably see the moths flying out the door and two very old gentlemen sitting inside. So sometimes the traditionalism is brought home to you. Hmm. Uh, but also it's much more pronounced in the countryside than in the cities. Uh, so the countryside can be very traditional in some ways, uh, whereas the cities are more, uh, slightly more cosmopolitan. And uh, does does this bleed into your life there? Like, do you do you enjoy a feeling of like a more traditional society, or no? Uh, yeah, in many ways. I'm not sure how I could put it into words, but yeah. Yeah, I was just. I curious. guess I do. Uh, but I, yeah, I'm not sure how I could articulate it. Uh, but it's on levels like so. This isn't connected to uh, the. Uh, woman question but there's uh, definitely less uh, neuroticism about speech codes when it comes to discussing ideas uh, people are just happier with their country not necessarily like how much money they're getting or uh, what kind of personality their boss has but just on the level of being patriotic uh, there's more of that hmm. and there's probably more of an instinct towards starting families and settling down than kind of lad culture or uh, wine mum culture, to use nasty phrases. But on the other hand, they still have like a reality TV show called Warsaw Shore, which is <laughs> a rip off of Geordie Shore and a rip off of uh, uh, Jersey Shore. So it would be naive to think it's like. Catholic paradise. Right. Fair enough. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, yeah. When my, uh, when I was saying before that my mother-in-law appeared in the chat and was, she basically, she was like, she came in to, to, to own the guy who said, who asked the question, uh, Oh, Triggerati. Yeah. She came in to try to own Triggerati. And, uh, the reason I mentioned it was because she followed it up with, you know, she said that objectifies women. Why don't you ask which women are more intelligent? And then I'm like, Sharon, you're not allowed to say that nowadays either. Like, there are no intelligence differences between populations. That is a no, no, Sharon. You're Absolutely. not, you're, you're, you're not woke enough. I'm just kidding, mom. You're good. You're woke enough in my book. Um, I don't, I'm not woke either. Being not woke is cool. If you're still listening to this, uh, actually being not woke is, is all the rage. Actually, mom, you're, in the intellectual dark web now congratulations if you think that if you think that populations have intelligence differences across country across countries your intellectual dark web idw my mom hashtag hashtag it up all right um enough about that uh we were uh just talking about oh some we're getting some questions about um do you follow accelerationism stuff or no oh uh, yeah from, from a distance uh do you, know, do you know nick land's work yeah, yeah, I know, I know uh, Nick Land's work. No, I haven't read all of it, but uh, sure. I've read a lot of his blog, and uh, I read Fanged, I don't even know how to pronounce it, Numena? I would say Nomina, but I think Nomina. people say it differently. Which was definitely a wild ride of a book. Uh, yeah. But yeah, yeah I, fo I follow it to some extent. 
I was just curious because someone someone's asking us to talk about it. I talk about his work enough. Um, but if I, if you have any thoughts, you could you could throw them out. Or if you don't, I mean, I, I I find it interesting just on a descriptive level of what could happen. Mm. Uh, I think the the, the clearest uh, models of what could happen are often from people who have very dark tendencies uh, because they're not biased by sentiment or optimism. So I think it's very interesting as uh, a potential model of the future. On the other hand, I wouldn't actually, like, I, I don't find it appealing on uh, an emotional level. Fair enough. Cool. Um, was, I think there was some guy who once wrote a big book about uh, a civil war breaking out between people who supported super intelligences and people who didn't. And I think if it if that war broke out, I'd be on the opposing side. So. Okay, good to know. Good to know where you stand. Um, as I said, I talk about that stuff enough, so I will. I don't need to go on a rant um, on that. So what I'm thinking is, uh, we should maybe move on to the next topic. What do you think? Yeah, that's it. We can move on to the final topic that you and I kind of roughly planned, um, mm -hmm. which is talking a little bit about woke academics. And you know. As an academic, as a fairly woke academic, even, I mean, I guess I'm not woke, hashtag not woke, but mm. as a somewhat woke academic or former woke academic, whatever you want to call it, um, this is actually a little bit of turf that I feel like I have a little bit of expertise on because, well, how should I put this? The expertise would be on, I have a little bit of expertise, I think, on the psychology of academics. Uh, because I've written about this, um, and I've thought about it a lot. And I've also, I've been in the game for like five years now as an, as an, as a professor, um, lecturer or whatever. Um, and while I've been kind of like fucking off on the work I was supposed to be doing, I've mostly been thinking and reading about like what is really going on with the people around me in this like strange place. Uh, so that's one thing I'll say that I've. I have some claim to speak on this. Like, I don't know if you happen to see I, about a year ago, I wrote an essay that like got a lot of traction on the psychology of prohibiting outside thinkers. I don't know if you mm -hmm. would have come across it then, but uh, it was like a fairly um, widely shared uh, blog post that basically addresses like exactly this question of like, why do academics as a as a whole tend to kind of uh, close the ranks like so aggressively against all possible outside you know, intellectual projects. Um, and at the time I actually wrote that in response to the, the people I had in mind were like people like Nick Land and Moldbug, who I was reading at the time and was very, you know, impressed with, with the intellectual sophistication and the, uh, just the, the sheer, yeah, I guess sophistication and, and interest of it all is clearly, you know, smart people like making serious arguments, uh, at, at length in a disciplined way. So it's like, that's more than enough to qualify for like being worthy of, of, of consideration, worthy of, 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 of note even. Uh, so I was really interested in, re I was reading them at the time and I was very much like, I was surprised, like, whoa, there are these like super smart kind of crazy people writing like pretty long, serious stuff on the internet, even though they're not academics, even though they're not getting paid to do it, even though they're like shunned by like prestige intellectuals, there's like a lot of really good intellectual crazy stuff going on out on the internet. And it's interesting and exciting. And, and I was like into it. So I was reading, that's when I was getting into like neo reaction and all that kind of stuff. Um, anyway, the reason I'm going on this long diatribe is because back then I, so I wrote, I wrote some stuff about this, like really trying to think through why academics are so uh, rabidly and kind of instinctually able to kind of like shit on and eject and reject all forms of intellectual culture bubbling up that are, that don't have the stamp of approval of, of academic prestige. Um, and so that's, that's where we're going with this. So, um, this dust up recently, like, like this guy, Matthew Sears, uh, who was, who's like been on quite a tirade, like shitting on, uh, or trying to, you know, like shit on, uh, you know, outlets like Quillette or whatever, um, I think they're mostly like cell phones, as they say, like, I don't think, you know, I think his like obsession with attacking people like Quillette or whatever um, is like, it shows much more that he's actually like quite 
obsessed with them in some sense. Like he's, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's, I think it's like quite a self own when academics are like going on and on trying to kind of like exercise like intellectual activity outside of academia. It just, there's something symptomatic there. It's kind of like, uh, because if you really don't respect something, you just don't pay any attention to it. I mean, yeah, you, yeah. you won't even you won't even look at it or acknowledge it. So there's always something deeper going on in, under the hood when academics are like really trying to shit on intellectual activity happening mm -hmm. elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I'm interested in this sort of phenomenon because there's a lot of it going on. One and two, you know, um, I generally don't get personal with my with my stuff. Like I try not. I generally don't attack people by name, and I don't want to like, you know, get make things like about like interpersonal fights or whatever. Um, but this guy came to my attention because he's like, he's getting really personal. He's like, he's like attacking Quillette, like the editors of Quillette, like Claire Lehman. He's like attacking people like her, um, like pretty aggressively and pretty personally. So it's like, when I see that sort of stuff by an academic and then I'm like, I'm very interested in all these people and these like this, like non academic, like intellectual ecology, um, I actually do feel a little bit of an obligation to like, as an academic to say like, Whoa, Hey man, like, you know, cool your jets. Um, and so, yeah, we just talked about, uh, you and I talked about like discussing this a little bit more. Um, but I just gave a little bit of a rant. Do you want to talk about this like larger topic at all? Yeah. The one thing, the one thing I'll say in Sears's defense is, uh, I think he got attacked first, but it was by Nazim Nicholas Taleb, who is just incredibly rude to everybody. Uh, and you, you wonder how uh, anyone puts up with him. I, I'm sure he's not the same in real life, but it, he's entertainingly rude on Twitter, but probably not if you just get targeted by him. I but mean, also, pretty, yeah. <laughs> I think the, the, the deeper motivation, uh, which I think all of the Traldi said first, who's at Autois Autois on Twitter, is uh, when they disagree with something like Breitbart, they might hate the content, but they don't feel it as any kind of rival, any kind of competition. Uh, but they, when you get a website like Quillette, a website like Aereo, a figure like Jordan Peterson, it's like someone moving into their space and they need to aggressively close ranks uh, to keep this kind of contender to their thrones away. 100%. Um, yeah, that's that's exactly what I wrote about, uh, like at length in, in that essay that I mentioned uh, that I wrote about a year ago. I think you're 100% right. And like my reading on it basically is that if you're an academic and that's your job and that's your status and you're highly in invested in that in that identity, you're you have a lot of anxiety right now because the pitchforks are out. Like there has never been so much mistrust towards academia, especially from conservatives. And like all of the mainstream institutions, like people have very, very low trust in in the media, but also, you know, they kind of lump in acad academia with with that, like this whole kind of populist right wing backlash that you're seeing in the UK and in the US, you know, people's I people's critical sites are on, you know, not just the politicians, but also the media and also ac academia. It's kind of seen mm -hmm. as like this big corrupted structure and, you know, anyone who's been inside of it knows that that there's a lot of truths to that i mean even leftists like in academia like there's a left-wing version of this and there's a right-wing version of this but most people who've gotten an inch you know away from academia um let alone inside of it know that this is like a fucked up system with all kinds of lies and dubious you know uh like consensus is that that you know it's like sometimes it's like soviet union level kind of mm -hmm. like collective delusion um that uh, that that defines academia um and it's not even necessarily like left wing or right wing although it's uh tends to be left wing because of the composition of the people in academia um my point is just to say that like there's a there's a strong sense within academia um that like a lot of things are unsustainable and people don't feel secure and people are a little paranoid. And you know what? Like they're kind of reasonable to, to, to feel so because especially if like you're a classic scholar and like you're, you're like, you're like expertise. The reason you make like a good paycheck over like the average person in your country is because you have like rare, rarefied knowledge of something that doesn't itself like produce money. 
Like if that's your claim to a middle class lifestyle and status and, and your identity, you you are going to be actually quite rational to 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 fight tooth and claw to protect mm-hmm. the institution that sponsors you, even though that institution is filled with fucked up problems and all kinds of all kinds of issues that even horrify leftists on the inside. Um, mm. So when you start to see that, like, there are non-academic institutions generating serious intellectual activity and 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 a whole ecology or community of upstart intellectuals of all different stripes who are actually – and this is what I think really terrifies people. There's so many people who write for Quillette and for write on personal blogs and, and just write all over the place and talk all over the place, YouTube even, who are seriously smart people. They're really mm. – there are some really smart people, like really high IQ people who can put together interesting ideas and arguments and have the discipline to constitute sign- like meaningful cultural projects. Like this stuff is happening. There are people doing it, and they don't need academic approval, and it's and it's really growing and growing. And so like if you – if your entire paycheck and identity is based on a rarefied institution like defining you as being smarter than other people – it's, you're actually quite rational to to fight tooth and claw against things like Quillette. Like it makes sense why you would be foaming at the mouth against Claire Lehman because she's just like a random, smart, educated person who decided to put together a website and create space for people that are not like allowed into academia or whatever. Um, like, yeah, you you. It makes sense that people are rabidly and instinctually just kind of like like throwing down the ranks and doing everything they can to to stop that and to decredit that uh, or delegitimate that as much as possible. Um, so I'm sympathetic to that. I'm actually quite sympathetic to it. Like, I, I understand where it's coming from. Um, but but like you can't lie and you can't smear shit. And the whole like performance of it is just so disingenuous that, you know, I'm kind mm-hmm. of getting a little bit more into the idea of maybe calling calling people by names. And, you know, this is what I think Taleb is like quite good at. Uh, you know, he's like an asshole, but he writes about how like with some things you got to you got to call a spade a spade and you, and you need to name names. And mm-hmm. I'm kind of becoming sympathetic to that because this guy like Matthew Sears, like you I'm sorry, but like people can see through your performance like we know what you're really doing here like we know what your real interests are we know what like the 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 underlying psychology is not that hard to see and i think people should you know maybe respectfully and constructively but perhaps somewhat aggressively if that's appropriate like call call out bullshit you know by name yeah that's definitely that being a more kind of uh positive response from the academia i don't know if you noticed the heterodox academy conference I saw about it, yeah. Which were basic. I mean, it, the the irony of the conference is that nobody there really had heterodox opinions. It was a group of academic leftists, a couple of liberals. I don't. I think there were no conservatives, but I could be wrong. There might have been a minority of conservatives, but they they weren't heterodox themselves. But they appreciated that the academy has to be more heterodox. Uh, more inclusive to other perspectives. All those other perspectives will just go somewhere else. Uh, Personally, I think it might be a good thing if those perspectives just go somewhere else, uh, which is kind of what you were saying in the beginning. You don't need to seek that kind of respect. Uh, But there's definitely a recognition of that. And then the flip side is people like Sears who are just lashing out uh, and trying to discredit uh, other publications or other personalities uh, and it's, it's going on what you're saying about calling out people by names it's quite nice for a lot of us who do write for these new publications because we're not in any kind of institutions and we're very much outsiders so we don't really have uh, any kind of social pressure or uh, guilt about calling people out by names Right. Although, of course, it should it should be done, and you know, it should be done in a polite and, if someone deserves it, respectful manner. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not advocating just random insults, but I'm with you 100. Like, so that's why I wanted to mention this guy Matthew Sears, who we're looking at now. Good looking chap. I got nothing against him. I'm not going to criticize his appearance. Although I do want to talk a little bit about his fashion sense, but from a respectful and constructive uh, place. For instance, like, I don't know, but I'm dubious about, or I'm skeptical, I should say, of academics who wear, like, ties. I think some people can pull it off, and some people, it makes sense. For instance, 
Jordan Peterson likes to wear a nice three piece suit sometimes. I, I've noticed he's he's definitely gotten a stylist. He wears some like posh, you know, formal wear. But the thing with Jordan Peterson is he's like he leans culturally conservative. So I believe it. Like I get where it's coming from. I think he genuinely mm-hmm. believes in uh having a disciplined appearance and 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 dressing like a professional. Um but if you're like woke, if you're woke and you wear a tie, I really I'm sorry, but I'm not saying you're a bad person and maybe you're worthy of trust, but off the on the face of it, if you're woke and you wear a tie, I don't trust you off the face of it. My my estimation my subjective estimation of you, my trust of you subjectively is uh is quite low. And the reason is precisely because if you're woke and you're also like performing a kind of like defense of currently existing respectable institutions, then you're almost by definition playing the typical like bourgeois hypocritical, hypocritical game. You know, like mm-hmm. if you actually really care about injustice and, you know, equality and, you know, freedom for all and these kind of like woke progressive ideals, then it's quite an affront to rock up to your like institutionalized academic job looking like a businessman because you're basically doing like performative ideology for an institutionalized system that like you're supposed to have no respect for you know so it's like if jordan peterson wants to wear a tie okay i get it it's consistent with his his temperament and his overall message but if you're woke and you think like the world is based on injustice and like all of contemporary capitalism is based on a history of unequal exploitation and it's like white supremacist to its roots and patriarchal to its roots to its roots and this is like the 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 cultural energy that you're trafficking in then don't wear a fucking suit don't take yourself so fucking seriously that's that's kind of my that's my two cents uh which is why you know like as you can see i like I don't even like shower as much as I should probably. And I kind of rock up to the internet with like stained shirts and, and uh, you know, I'm not like, you know, proud about those things. I'm not like, Oh, I'm cool. Lefty, like nonchalant, like surfer skater, bro. Just doesn't give a fuck, bro. Like I'm, I don't like, I'm not that either. I'm just in my view, if you're like, if you're, if you're really passionately opposed to like institutionalized status quo injustices, um, I think you should be like, how should I put this? Like a real intellectual um, who like leans left should not be caring about things like how you appear and looking respectable and looking polished and professional. You should just be like reading all day and writing all day and not giving a fuck. Uh, That's like the proper way to be a lefty intellectual. The honest way to be a lefty intellectual is to just like to be rebellious, to not care what people think, to uh, dress however the fuck you feel like and just get so obsessed with your own thoughts and reading and, and writing and making connections with people online. And just like that's the aesthetic and the ethics and and I think politics of like a genuine radical left kind of like cultural uh, project. Um, and that's my rant on that. <laughs> I, I just worry that if you told a bunch of middle aged male academics uh <laughs> to dress in a more relaxed way, they'd rock up in leather jackets and soon they'd be driving motorbikes and starting covers bands and that kind of repressed midlife crises would just burst out. Maybe the suit is the only thing that's holding them together. Maybe, although, no, you know what though? I, I think my theory holds, even if you look at like the data, the behavioral data of academics, because generally like the most legit intellectuals that I know in academia, dress like slobs basically or at best at best they're um just very relaxed they look like completely normal dudes normal dads or whatever or or wives or mothers or whatever the fuck i didn't mean to gender that i slipped up sorry people that was a legitimate sexist gendering sorry it was unconscious unconscious bias. hashtag sleep hashtag what hashtag sleep hashtag sleep hashtag Hashtag woke. Um, Yeah. So anyway, what I was saying is that I think this theory actually holds up that like the most legit intellectuals just look like normal people. If you go into academia, like if you walk around universities, all the people that there's a correlation, like the more dressed up you are, the more of like a bullshit like administrator you are. (laughs) I think I think that really holds. I think that generally holds up. 
I haven't been on a university campus in nearly a decade, so I'm not can't really comment. I don't know what they're wearing. Fair enough. It's, it's a foreign country. Fair enough. Oh, and also just since we're like still in gossip mode and calling people by their names, um, I just want to show that um, I said before, like this guy, Matt Sears, is obsessed with Quillette. Like if you Google Matthew Sears on Quillette and look at his and look at like the search results that come up, it's like tweet after tweet of him mentioning Quillette. You know, like this is not a guy who, you know, has genuine contempt for outside startup intellectual projects that he sees as like you know unworthy like this is a guy who's like obsessed with possible competition to his like status i think um because you just don't talk so much shit about something that you genuinely uh see as unworthy that's my that's my read anyway so, hello yeah you got me can you hear me oh yeah i lost you for a moment the thing he said which really annoyed me which i ran about on twitter but i'll repeat it here is he was saying that uh, publications like Quillette claim to be uh, free thinking and engaged in like radical intellectual inquiry, but actually they're just flattering people's prejudices. And I don't know if he's aware or not that when he writes something which is very woke, it's not like all his readers are reading it and go, wow, my God, I, I, my whole paradigm has shifted. He's flattering people's prejudices as much as uh, anyone is, because whatever opinion you hold and whatever conclusions you reach, you're going to flatter someone's prejudices, because we all, we all have different preconceptions. And sometimes our prejudices are right and sometimes they're wrong, and that's not what's important. Yo, I mean, honestly, I wonder if he would talk with me. I would be happy to talk with him. Like, I, I, you know, I obviously disagree with him in some ways. Uh, and I'm, and I, yeah, I'm, I, I guess I'm somewhat provocatively uh, saying that I, I think what he's saying is disingenuous, and he's playing a different type of game than he pretends to be playing. I guess I've, in some sense, accused him of doing that. But you know, it's not from a bad place. Like, I'm sure he's a smart guy. I'm sure he's a nice guy. Uh, I'm sure he doesn't mean. It. You know, I'm sure I'm sure he, you know, uh, would be quite interesting to talk with. And I would be happy to talk with him with an open mind. Um, but I wouldn't honestly, he's the type of guy who I wouldn't really even think to to ask to talk with me because precisely because he seems to think that like anyone who does stuff related to these like, you know, topics and networks is like evil or like shouldn't be talked with. So I, I kind of I interpret him as kind of saying like he's not interested in having this conversation because mm -hmm. he sees like I don't know, maybe he maybe he even sees me as like an illegitimate like apologist for who knows what or something. Like, I don't I don't I don't know. But my point is like I would be happy to talk with him. Um but the only reason I'm not like you know talking with him or asking him to be on here or whatever is because I imagine he's not into it. But yeah, he does. He does keep arguing with people on Twitter, so he might be interested in coming on. I guess, as long as he's not like really fond of his of his tie, <laughs> and he's gonna watch watch you talking about his clothes, and he's gonna be like, all right, that's out. Oh no! Did that? Did that? Don't insult my clothes. Is that is that how I cross the line? Shit. Um, I don't know. Maybe don't know. maybe could someone in the in the chat that's watching this, who's like at all adjacent to. To Matthew Sears, and maybe you could like don't all do it. I'm not telling you to get on him uh, at all. Don't do that. I'm not at all saying that. But maybe someone could like tweet at him and ask him if he wants to come in here right now. <laughs> <laughs> he could join us for like, you know, we could have a you know very relaxed and mature and open minded conversation about it if he wanted to uh, to join us. I mean, I'm sure he's like not just like sitting around the internet waiting for this sort of like opportunity to do this right yeah. although actually i mean he's so game on twitter that he might actually be ready and available he, he, right he now. does seem extremely online could someone could someone tweet at him just like one or two of you tweet at matthew sears and uh say that me and ben would like to talk with him in person if he's willing right now i could give him an invite link right now if he wants to sometimes i do watch like these YouTube debates and streams. And it is amazing how available people are. <laughs> I kind of imagine them just sitting next to their computers, just wait, waiting to drop in. Right. I mean, can you imagine if you were at a party and like there were people just standing behind different doors? 
And someone said, hey, bring Sargon in. And you just opened the door and there he was. Yeah, uh, yeah. But we'll see. No, you're right. It's so interesting and it's so cool. Like, you know, it's so obvious to me. I've, I've, I tend to talk about this a fair bit, so I won't, I won't uh, harp on it. But like, it's so obvious to me that blogging and, you know, video chat and stuff like this is like, if you're really interested in intellectual advancement and making new ideas and making new connections and solving thorny problems and, and stuff like that, like, it's so obvious to me that these tools are still being radically underutilized by like mm. serious prestige, you know, respectable scholars and academics that it's like that itself is, I think a pretty damning indictment of what the fuck all these academics are even doing with their time and energy. Like mm -hmm. it's clearly not, you know, like take the, take the typical academic conference, for instance, it's like this really long, difficult to organize, expensive to organize, affair like at a hotel in like one city in the world where like thousands of people spend thousands of dollars to get there to give mm -hmm. like to give like a one five minute uh paper um to like five other people in the room and it's like extraordinarily expensive and uses so many resources and achieves a horrifyingly small amount of intellectual um, production and, and stimulation. It's like, well, okay, well then what the fuck is really going on here? Like, what are these people really doing? If it's, it's clearly not intellectual work. Like it's not trying to maximize intellectual connection and it's not trying to maximize. Uh, it seems like it's trying to maximize the amount of money spent. Like, honestly, like if you look really honestly at it, that's kind of what it looks like. And then you get into mm. academia and you go to these conferences and you realize that actually it is kind of just like vacations for people. Like mm. it's a way for people to get away from their, from their kids and to uh, have like drinks at the bar with like people they went to grad school with. Like it's mostly a massive, big expensive boondoggle for, for like us, for like an interest group to go on vacation. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't want to sound too Max terrible, but you know, maximize other forms of communication. Well, yeah, and but so I think social it's, or yeah. if the yeah. gossip is true, sexual or uh, definitely, yeah. But it depends on the academics. Well, I have the, I have this kind of theory though that I think like increasingly doing this kind of stuff that you and I are doing right now will actually become a kind of signal of genuine intellectual interest. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. like if you're spending. Like right now, people just don't really know how to interpret these signals. So everyone still kind of imagines that academics are at least like trying to to optimize like intellectual goals um, uh, because, you know, we update very slowly and there's like all this historical inertia in our, in our mental models, um, you know, but like I think it will increasingly become clear that like if you're an academic and you're spending your time like going to like big costly conferences and stuff like that, mm -hmm. like it will actually lead people to downgrade their subjective estimation of your like intellectual quality because <laughs> because it's like understood correctly it's actually a pretty strong sign that like whatever it is you're trying to maximize it's not really like the intellectual life but if you're like willing to just fire up youtube and get on the mic with like some other random but interesting and intelligent seeming person like if that's what you spend all your time doing that's increasingly going to be seen as a signal as a credible signal of like okay this might be like an interesting intelligent person who's actually like on the tail of something quite interesting that I want to pay attention to. You know what I mean? Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm completely guessing here because I don't really know much about uh, the internal workings of universities, but I, I wonder if because they're so expensive, it's like a signal of how much you're prepared to invest in working with other people. Mm. Uh, it's almost like a hazing ritual, maybe just, investing so much time and money in in this rather pointless little affair uh, shows how much you're prepared to commit to maybe not this field, but this uh, this network of academics. But I don't yeah, know, that's just a guess. I definitely think you're right that there is something like that going on. I mean, there's no doubt that prestige economies are, are like a a historically necessary and effective selection mechanism. You know, like in a world where only only so many people can have access to like the microphones that broadcast to to the population. Um mm. 
there needs to be some device or mechanism for selecting like who's going to get the right to talk you know i think this like this makes sense even as late as like the 60s like when television and like broadcast systems were like the dominant kind of like media form it, it kind of makes sense like for most of history like you do need some like there's so many people everyone's got a message everyone's making noise there's got to be some way to determine like who's got the high quality signals that we want to pay attention to and who should get the yeah. who should get the platform and who and who who shouldn't get that platform and i think prestige economies have been like a, a long standing solution to that and and i think that's what you said the, what you said applies there like you mm. set up you set up all of these costly obstacles these time consuming money consuming energy consuming challenges uh hoops to jump through and like if you can rise to the top of academia despite all of the anti intellectual roadblocks well that's a pretty good sign that you're you know fit that's a fitness indicator right mm -hmm. um it kind of makes sense and it kind of works in some in some ways but the thing is that every the, the game is still the game is totally different now and it's still people are still not updating to it like some people talk as if like the internet is like old news but it's not mm -hmm. it's like barely barely begun people have barely begun to update their models and their and their behaviors around it i think and i think this is a really good example of 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 how that of how that is the case this is one this is one data point in that in other words like yes to get into academia you do have to do all of the song and dance to and it is it's like a, a legacy selection mechanism to prove that you ha that you are smart and disciplined and able um the thing is that you don't need to do it anymore so no. so if for you intellectual are, inquiry you don't need it yes so if you are oh. doing it so if you are doing it then the question becomes what are you actually trying to do like what are you actually trying to maximize and the mm. answer is now i think the answer is increasingly clear the answer is you're trying to inc you're trying to maximize your influence and your power like mm. that's the only reason why you would submit to like a whole life of bowing before like time wasting energy wasting stupidities that academia is and this is coming from someone who's who's doing i'm actively doing this like and and to be perfectly honest not to toot my own horn but I'm successful too. Like, I'm, I mean, I'm like a very successful early career researcher um, who's mm -hmm. like, I'm succeeding as you know, as far as the game goes. So this isn't like sour grapes. It's, it's just observing honestly, like what's going on around me. And that's why I'm turning to the internet so much right now, because I'm kind of like, wait, someone pinch me. Is this like, is, is this really what's going on? Like, is the world really the way it honestly looks to me? Or am I missing something? Because my attitude is just kind of like, yeah, like there's nothing wrong with wanting influence. Well, maybe there, i think there is actually something wrong with wanting influence and power but i guess what i'm getting at is like many people go into academia thinking like you need to do this to to be able to have a job where you're able to you know work on your ideas and those ideas are going to have effect and influence and be recognized and and have and have significance like it's reasonable enough to think i need to go through this this prestige competition to to earn the right for my ideas to have an effect on the world and for me to have a job and, and re related to it like that whole pl that whole reasoning is like fair enough it's not necessarily perverse evil you know will to to dominate or something like that um but when you get there when you're doing that and you get there and you're like looking around and it becomes once it becomes clear that like you can actually have a a very you know non-trivial platform just by doing mm -hmm. good work just by doing good work on the internet like just doing honest good work that you're interested in that you believe in doing it on the internet and doing it seriously like that really will it does bubble to the top like it does get you as uh, probably as much influence as the average academic has um like you know the academia is not exactly a very reliable pathway to influence like most academics don't have any influence so it's like i think that's, that's definitely true i mean i was a complete academic failure for one reason or another Oh, yeah? uh, and after after that wondered about going back but never did interesting uh, but i mean if i'd gone and tried to do an ma tried to do a phd might have been good for my career and also to be fair maybe i could have created something more substantial but you know it might have been read by 10 people if i'd written a phd whereas uh not to blow smoke but Mm -hmm. When you write something for somewhere like Quillette, you end up getting thousands of readers and relatively influential people end up reading. So I hope that's not why I do it, but it's it's nice, you know. You don't have to go through the process to get that reach. Yes, exactly. And and like whatever your temperament is, whatever your po politics are, you know, it doesn't have to be Quillette. It can be any other any other platform. Like yeah. there's there's a wide um diversity of just fairly random like startup intellectual startup 
uh, platforms on on the internet, or you make your own. You know, you know whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. The, what what this all boils down to is that, like, there is no reason to submit to like anti intellectual. Um, competition procedures to mm-hmm. enter into this like ancient traditional uh, selection competition when unless unless and this is this is where this is what I think is so interesting and important for people to realize unless like you're trying to optimize something else and the puzzle mm-hmm. is the puzzle is like what what are they trying to optimize um, and this is why I'm so interested in the psychology of academics because you know, I've kind of like arrived in academia and I got lucky I worked hard. Yes. But I also got lucky. And, and like, it's, a lot of it is like very, very much a lottery in terms of like getting a tenure track position. And I, I mean, I, I lucked out, like I won the lottery also. So now that I'm there, I'm kind of like, I'm like, I'm like looking behind, behind the curtains and I'm like, this is, this can't be real. Right. This is not like what this is actually like. So I'm just like trying to figure out like where the fuck, like where the fuck I am and how, how like my mental model needs to be like completely updated. Uh, because like academia is just not what people thought it was. Um, Oh, right. But where I was going with that is to say that, you know, what I think people are actually optimizing for is, uh, just status for its own sake, I think. And, Mm -hmm. and security and security. I mean, if you think about it, like the main things that academia can give you, if you can, if you can work hard and win the lottery and get a tenure track position, you're respected by other people. You have the stamp of respectability. Uh, you have a profession that people like look up to and admire. So you get that status bump, uh, and, and it's secure. Like it it, it is, Mm -hmm. you know, if you get tenured, it is still very secure. So like, what it what academia really is is it's an intellectualized status competition that is almost fully occupied now by people who are primarily op- who are smart yes and 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 variably you know uh, intellectually able and often very intellectually able and sometimes with with very legitimate interesting valuable projects no doubt but on the whole as an institution on average it's mostly an intellectualized um like performance that is really about people who mostly crave status and security like that's the name of the game and i think the reason i'm kind of seeing this more clearly than maybe other people or maybe the reason i'm like thinking about it and talking about it more than other other academics is because i've never really had much of a taste for status i I never really wanted like that wasn't what i was in the game i never want like that's not what i what i came here for at all Mm. i'm not saying i'm like Oh, I'm so noble. I no, not at all. I mean, I have all my imperfections as anyone. Like, and I enjoy status, like everyone does. But it's not like what I got into this game for. Um, and also security. Like, I have a high tolerance for like risk, and and I, I have a low demand for for security, to be honest. So, like, the two things that seem to be like what most people around me are actually looking for, and the reason they're here, is actually like they're two things that just did not that had nothing to do with why I wanted to be here. And so now I'm just like trying to make sense out of like where where I am. <laughs> Well, it sounds like a healthy attitude to take if you want to uh, keep your own uh, keep your own thoughts and keep your own ideas, and not um, end up walking into somebody else's mold for an academic. Well, thank you. I appreciate that, but it is also um, it's a bit of a problem for me now because I'm like I basically need to. I, I have no idea what to do, to be honest. <laughs> like mm. I, I, I think I'm. I mean, like I said, I'm doing. Uh, I'm doing well in like my career, but I'm not going to like, this is not for me. It's not for me. It's I, like, mm-hmm. I'm not going to, I don't want to be here that I, I cannot imagine my whole life in this, in this career. Uh, mm-hmm. But this is like all I've ever set out to do. Like ever since I was like came of age, like I only ever had one goal, which was like to be an academic. And I was lucky enough to get that. And now that I'm here, I'm like, this is not like, I don't know. I don't even know. Yeah. Um, that's why, that's why I'm like so obsessed with this. And that's why I'm like ranting at you. Sorry. I'm like kind of uh, lecturing like a little crazy. Well, right now. Hopefully something will come of these decentralized spaces and the other places where you can work. And, you know, it's hard to uh, monetize, which is why it's difficult to do full time. Uh, but we never know what the future holds. Uh, yeah. If these kind of mediums is, uh, increasingly replace old media and uh, traditional forms of education. 
it right. could provide a reasonable alternative to that kind of career. Right, right. Well, I just went on a long rant, so I do uh, apologize for that. I'd like to kind of give you an opportunity now to, uh, you know, go on any rants you want to. In fact, is this something that, as someone who uh, writes, yeah, I mean, you write a lot on, on the internet. Um, I, I'm pretty impressed by your, especially for someone who says that you you say that you didn't do well in, in uh, university. So, um, you know, you have quite an impressive, you know, kind of list of, of online writings um, and publications online. So like, where do you see all of this going? Uh, like in terms of, you know, like the future of, of intellectual influence and um, clearly you you believe in trying to figure things out and, and, and putting time and effort and energy into, into, into getting your thoughts into words and, and building, you're clearly like building you know, a corpus, uh, uh, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. So, like, do you think that we're going into a place where, you know, people like you, there'll be more and more people like you, and that'll be more and more successful and influential, and maybe there will be, um, you know, like, uh, traditional institutions of higher education will kind of implode from just the increasing prevalence of non-academic intellectuals just doing interesting stuff that starts to kind of drown out the academic nonsense like do you see that kind of that that'd be like a more positive trajectory and positive in the sense of like what you and i i think are both kind of into um or i don't do you, know about implode but i do think it will significantly decentralize and other institutions will replace it uh, well not replace it but gain some of its influence and uh some of it's clamped. Well, because some people think that, you know, like political correctness and SJWism and, and its whole kind of like academic um, complex is, is like going to be increasingly strong and pervasive and, and it will increasingly start to lock down more and more. Do you mm. not think that? Um, I'm not sure already. I can't see. Uh, I can't see any kind of coherent outcome for the future. And that I think there will be uh, great divisions on all levels of society. Uh, so you will have that hyper leftist corner, and then you will have more. I hope not just anti SJW because it's quite a boring thing to become, but more <laughs> conservative, more libertarian spheres mixing together. Right. Right. Well, hey, man, I'm conscious that we've now been going for a little bit more than an hour and a half. And uh, so I don't want to overtax you. Uh, you're probably we're probably both maybe starting to run out of steam a little bit. I don't know about you. Um, yeah, I, I, I've got to admit, I am a bit. It's, I'm an hour ahead of you, so I'm uh -huh. uh, yeah, fading no a little bit. Totally. Yeah, no worries. I'm, I'm starting to kind of fade, too. Also, because I started even a half hour before you joined me. So uh, this is when this is when, like, my the quality of my, like, sentences starts to uh take a nosedive so i think i should get i should get out of out in front of that and uh bring things to a close now but uh dude this was really cool we covered a lot we covered a lot of ground we talked about a yeah. whole lot of things um i hope you did you find this interesting yeah i did it was great talking to you uh and i hope your viewers enjoyed it too yeah yeah thanks for um you know answering some questions and being a being a good sport about it um it was very edifying and uh, yeah, I appreciate, I appreciate your interest in doing this kind of random intellectual type of uh, exchange experiment. So yeah, thanks again. It was good fun. Thanks for having me, man. All right, Ben, I'll be in touch with you later, dude. Later. All right, people. I'm fried. I'm done. I hope you enjoyed that. Thanks for hanging out with me for so long. And uh, yeah, I still need some good signing off phrase. Like someone said in the last chat, I need some cool thing that I say at the end, like, I don't know, something exciting that's fun and ritualistic. It's not a cult, but, you know, rituals are cool. All right, people, I'm out of here. Talk to you later. Thanks for listening, everybody. If you have any thoughts on that, good or bad, definitely let me know. Shoot me an email or you can DM me on Twitter. If you were really into that, you might leave a review on iTunes. That would be cool. Or if you were really, really into that, you might want to become a patron yourself. You can check that out at patreon.com slash jmurphy with no U. All right, cool. Talk to you later.